Um, so I'm a, I'm a registered psychotherapist in Canada and um, had a couple trainings in psychedelic therapy, which of course I'm not doing yet, but the training uh, has starting. So, uh, so that's a bit of my background. I also have about 12, uh, 12 years in frontline community mental health crisis work. So a lot of, you know, um, hospital and police diversion, a lot of sort of, uh, you know, suicide, uh, psychosis, addiction, a lot, of, a lot of that work. So you'll see that that sort of informs a lot of uh, what's, what's going on here today. So the plan, and we'll do it pretty short today, but we're going to be talking about the rationale, why I'm doing it, a bit about the design and the results. The results are early and there's not as much data as I want, but I'll, I'll show you guys sort of what I've seen so far. And then some next steps, some ideas to move forward. So here is my rationale in a nutshell. Um, in the middle, sort of like what my experience was like. So my experience microdosing, uh, my experience with you know having some burnout at work, um, seeing that there's a need for maybe some more grassroots research in uh, in the field of, of psychedelics, um, and then sort of in the middle there is what I saw. So you know the intentions of friends of mine and, and colleagues, a lot of burnout in the field that I was seeing, people um, lacking self care. And then in the larger scheme is sort of, you know, barriers to research. We got the drug laws. We have the mental health system in general, just sort of a, you know, the sort of an outdated system in general, uh, the way I see it. So, so that's sort of the rationale behind what I was doing. And sort of the, the media and cultural trends too. Like there were a lot of articles that come out about microdosing being good for productivity or, you know, to, to, you know be, to be better at work and sort of to perpetuate this capitalist uh, sort of consumer regime. Um, also, part of the rationale was things that I was seeing, some things in, in different uh, literature and James Fadiman's book, which sort of got me onto the, the microdosing, um, kind of put it into different categories, uh, deepening of spiritual practice, things like mindfulness. These are things that I noticed in myself as well, um, social engagement, connectedness, um, openness. And then sort of on the outside there, you see in a lot of ways sort of just an increase of awareness of, of these things as well. So I think I heard somewhere, I think James Fadiman talked about if you have anxiety, microdosing might not be good, but they don't know if it's because it actually increases the anxiety or that it just makes you more aware of it. So um, I think that's an important thing, especially sort of near the end to keep in mind. So why mental health workers? Uh, well, they get exposure to a lot of other people's trauma and suffering. Um, I know we all do, especially like in the media and, and out on the street, but there's sort of more pressure to relieve that trauma um, from the mental health perspective, right? So people are coming in and they, you know, they, they have all of these past issues and you're sort of put on the spot to, to fix that. Um, so I think that a lot of, um, a lot of that trauma exposure that, that we get has a lot to do with, um, you know, the, the system sort of perpetuating itself and not necessarily getting better from the inside out. Um, also, you know, the monetized over medicalized paradigm, the lacks compassion, support, and transpersonal paradigms, also lacks sort of a normalization of self-care. Um, and then I had a lot of contacts and access to mental health workers, so that had a big, a big thing. And, and obviously my own personal experience in the, in the current system was uh, a big factor of that. Um, seeing that microdosing helped me sort of take that step back, and I wanted to see if that was a common thing for other people. So a sort of broad hypothesis was that mental health workers have less compassion for self and more for others. And that's because what I saw was sort of that people wanted to help, but then at the expense of themselves and they would skip lunch and, you know, all these things. So um, I wanted to see whether that was true and then also whether microdosing increased awareness of those things and therefore created more um, of a positive effect on self-compassion and compassion for others. So here's a bit of the design. So there were four populations. So there was the control control, which was basically non-mental health workers and they didn't take a microdose. And then we had non-mental health workers who took a microdose and the me mental health workers who didn't take a microdose. So they were the control and then mental health workers who took the microdose. And these were people sort of that I knew that were gonna be doing it. It's sort of like the James Fadiman approach where I didn't, um, you know, I, I didn't do a study where I, you know, gave it to the people and then did it. It was more, they were gonna be doing it anyway. So I got them to fill out some forms, which I'll explain right now. So I did a pre and post test with, um, it's NEF's validated compassion scale, which studied self-compassion, compassion for others, and then sense of meaning in life. And I'll talk a bit more about that after. 
And then there was some qualitative data, some questionnaires for the mental health workers, um, just three questions, um, which I'll also show after. So that was sort of the design. Um, part of Neff's compassion scale, so for compassion, these were the different, uh, different items that, she was, uh, that she's looking for. So within kindness and indifference and all of them, I think there's about five questions each and you get an average and then you, uh, you make a, a mean out of that. And then for self-compassion, um, similar thing, but just there, she was looking for a couple different things. So the, these are the things that we have data on now. And I didn't do uh, one by one. I didn't look at them yet. I think that'll be something interesting to look at in the future, but I didn't um, end up time. And because uh, this was sort of just a solo mission. Um, so the sample, the age range was from 25 to 65. Uh, 15 females, 12 males. The mental health population was, you know, anything from social workers to uh, psychotherapists. Uh, I wasn't in the study though. Uh, case managers, crisis workers, there was a psychiatry resident and occupational therapists. And then in the control, um, sort of just retirees, there were massage therapists, people in the tech industry, PhD students, um, a business owner, and then the yoga therapist, I put that person in the control because it was more of like a physical therapy. It wasn't um, sort of using, you know, yoga as sort of a emotional, mental, um, like trauma work. So <clears throat> that's why that person went over there. So sort of some early data so far. So self-compassion, um, I was right. So mental health workers did score lower on self-compassion. As you can see there, uh, that would be the I mean, the mental health control and the mental health microdose. Um, ultimately, uh, the pre were lower than the rest, I would say, or about average to the control control. And the mental health workers who microdose, they did go up in, in self-compassion. And then this is the compassion score, which actually was surprising. Mental health workers didn't have a lot more compassion um, in this, in this uh, scale compared to the control. In fact, the control control went up to the highest, which was interesting as well. Um, so for me, though, the, the most interesting part of microdosing and, and psychedelics in general and sort of what I'm, what I'm looking at was more how does that impact a person's life and how does it impact their work and how do they integrate that? So how do they sort of make meaning of it um, and bring it into their day-to-day -day life? And so I wanted to show you this because this is really interesting. So this was... Um, in the population, the name was Q, so a female, 36-year-old, and both the compassion and self-compassion scores went down. But I think what that hints at is that just like in, in you know, macrodosing, sometimes there's a difficult stage. Um, and I only gave people, um, like I wanted them to do six, right? I gave them a window of six microdoses just because in case some people didn't react well to it or, um, and I didn't, once again, have too much time. So just six was like a good number. I found a couple weeks worth and then they could do the pre and the post. Um, so this person went down in both, yet if we look at the sort of qualitative data, uh, the overall impressions were mood and energy were a bit increased, more aware of how they were feeling, uh, a sense of mindfulness, connecting intensely with other people and with nature, with a higher power. Um, so, so I think what's happening is maybe the person's starting to notice more about, oh yeah, I don't have as much compassion uh, or, or uh, compassion for myself, but <clears throat> that could just be part of the process of like um, moving through that to, to integrate it in a deeper level. So I think what I'm going to do is uh, maybe like a six month follow up with people just to see sort of where they're at, um, which I think could be really interesting. And then same, same person here. So impact on self-awareness, more eager to engage in activities that bring me joy. Um, and then like a sense of peace. And once again, this is someone who's, whose compassion and self-compassion both went down. So I think that this is really interesting and I want to follow up with, with looking at some of the subscales a little bit more. And then with working with clients, so more connected to clients, feeling uh, the interaction deeply, um, clients responding well to sort of, uh, to, yeah, to really feeling authentically with the person. 
and, um, and yeah, feeling authentic and really valuing that. So, so once again, I think that was really one of the more interesting parts rather than just the numbers here. I think the more interesting thing is, is getting the, the qualitative data from people. Um, so I'm going to be sort of looking more into that as, uh, as time goes by. So limitations, I mean, there were a bunch because, once again, it was a grassroots sort of preliminary study, uh, very community-based. So there was a small sample size. There was no blind sample or placebo. It wasn't randomized. There was an intention bias. Like, for example, they knew I was looking for compassion, uh, but they all did. So in a way, it sort of might... Uh, equal, equal out. Um, we're talking about an illegal substance, which is also a limitation. Uh, potency factor wasn't controlled. I try to get people to do the same amount, um, and I know that a lot of them were the Mexicana um, psilocybin, so that was somewhat controlled, but the potency factor, we don't know for sure, um, so that was another limitation. Um, so for next steps, I mean, there's a ton of different ways I want to take this, but I would like to increase the people that I, that I look at uh, with this. I'd like to go into other first responders, so um, firefighters, <clears throat> paramedics, um, you know, nurses, sort of just to see, even just at a baseline compassion and self-compassion scale, um, I'd really like to see what that looks like for different first responders, because I think that could be interesting. Because I think in a lot of ways, if the system doesn't change, how can we um, how can we change it from the inside out, right? How do we help people sort of gain awareness of these things and, and start to integrate these experiences and, and find more value in what they're doing? Um, and I also didn't look at the meaning of life scale, which I think could be that missing link as well. Um, so I'll, I'll be doing that uh, after. Um, analysis of subscales would be really interesting. And more analysis of quantitative and also qualitative. Uh, maybe publishing something somewhere that, you know, would take this sort of thing even just online. Um, and doing a blind study, so having um, maybe some people take a placebo, um, like niacin or um, something like that. So that is basically it. I ran through that quickly because I know I started late. And so we have time for questions. What's that? You're right on time. Right on time, exactly. Thanks. Uh, I'll answer some questions.